we begin by chance. A complex dance of nature nurtured. The ebb and flow of life gifted your place in time. You are fragile. You are strong. You've got the power. It's within you. Chance brought you here. You have nothing to fear by beginning. So take a chance and never stop swimming. By wanting not just to exist, we begin. How nice it is on a summer's day to stroll across the fields and meadows with the sun shining and the birds singing. Here nature is ever close at hand and just as the seasons come and go in part succession, so also do the seasons of life. This is their world, a way of life to which even the youngest belong, and because they love the land. They love the eerie cries of the moorland birds, the high heavens, and the music of the wind. A world of limitless horizons, they would have no other. All is quiet, and I look ahead. I see the river bend, and then I think, how far does the river flow? Does it go on forever? Now the start of the morning is on this Monday morning. Not too bad this morning, apart from fog. A bit of fog around there. I don't know how bad it is yet, but. We can certainly stop worrying about sky tippets because today's weather is going to be even warmer than yesterday's weather. Tomorrow's weather is going to be warmer than today. And phew, it's going to be a scorcher. This is the world we're building for ourselves today. And this is progress. Civilization must progress. But whereas other forms of life adjust to the available food supply, man tries to provide for the growing needs of a rapidly expanding population regardless of the space available for expansion. If civilization is to be worthy of the name, then it too must ensure that a balance is maintained. Eventually, the industrial expansion swallowed up a pleasant countryside area with rows of monotonous terraced houses spreading for many miles around the city. Kids shouldn't have to grow up in soft and low. It isn't right. What can they look for? What can they look forward to? We've lost so much of the peripheral space around where people live. We've had children who've never played on grass before. There aren't always even trees for them to climb. I come out of the back door. The air clings to the sky. Walk out of the back gate, looking at its dingy green. Walking out of quietness and into loudness, I walk to school in a world of my own. It's the privilege of young people to discover the passing bird, the secrets of the seashore, and the apparently serene meadowland. Soon they're racing through our pleasant Yorkshire countryside. There's a lot to see as they go along. What we do is give children a chance to actually get out and do hands-on experiential environmental education in the sort of environment that most of their parents used to take for granted. 9,000 town kids a year flock to Newhouse Farm. It's a unique project, giving children who think milk comes out of a bottle the chance to understand about how everything from a pig to a plough fits into life down on the farm. These hills are a never-ending source of delight and relaxation. And 
whether the choice be modest rock climbing, rough walking or just gentle rambling, here is the country close at hand to satisfy him. It's to do with reconnecting with the earth and the land where we live. I think our, our society's got so alienated from our environment, it, it, it's seen as an issue instead of part of our very being. Open-cast coal mining is a means of producing low-cost fuel. It's much cheaper than deep mine methods. It provides lots of local jobs. It clears up dereliction, and it saves on imports. The industry will need to concentrate on maximizing profits and to focus on profitable production and marketing. That scar is on this landscape forever. You're looking at, you know, the last remnants of open countryside that we've got. And if you turn it into a, a mess like this, what are we going to turn around to future generations and say that we let it happen? How they could, you know, like put our livelihood in the same frame as what somebody likes to drive along the road on Sunday afternoon and look over there. It's nice to look at, fair enough. But that doesn't, that doesn't feed my family. For years, Coal was cheap and provided our warmth at home and the heat for industry. But with what result? A smoke-filled, dirty atmosphere. For months they've been campaigning against the thick, acrid smokes, but got absolutely no reaction from the company. It, it has made living in our environment unbearable. We cannot open our windows. It's a plant which will, without doubt, create a, a health hazard, as well as being a nuisance, smell, smoke and dirt. It's a killer. If you go to the doctor, he'll tell you that. It's, you breathe it in all the time, especially for the people that's living around where it's yeah. joining there. Yeah. <coughs> we feel we've had to take pretty drastic steps. With this action, Greenpeace are laying down uh, three demands to the government to, to do something about this problem uh, and the fact that we're the worst neighbour in Europe regarding uh, pollution on this level. You can't have a major industrial plant and have no fumes, but what I think they are entitled to expect is that the best practical means are used to suppress the nuisance. We are taking very active steps now concerning pollution, and this we shall go on with. We have powers, and the industrialists themselves are really coordinating with us and doing something about it. And I don't think it's going to be as bad as people think. In fact, I think it's going to be better. We need to stop the way that this system currently is genuinely squeezing the life out of the, of the world around us. Today's weather is going to be even warmer than yesterday's weather. And tomorrow's Since then, a month of drought has reduced yields. The fires began in early June. There were 81 separate and outbreaks. last night's almost equatorial storm. With the heaviest rainfall since records began. That's quite serious flooding for the city of York. Land which had taken 8,000 years to develop was destroyed in eight months. Nature has done its best and failed. Not the end of the world! Surely, if one is bringing in hair, the most contemporary industry that you can think of, we're guarding against slump, we're creating wealth within the place, and the people, the young people, that will grow up with a better environment. And this is exactly what we want. This is what we're striving for. Man's intelligence, which has given him great skills and wealth, has been a two-edged sword. He has polluted the air everything breathes, the water everything drinks, the earth everything grows on. Can you modify your effluent at all? Yes, we could modify it, we could recycle it, we could neutralise it, but it would cost us a tremendous amount of money. Every year, a sizeable amount of our solid waste is discharged, untreated, straight into the sea. 
over a third of our officially designated beaches fail to meet EEC safety standards. Whatever you put offshore through a pipeline uh, will come back onshore. It is neither scientifically sound nor advisable from a public health and environmental viewpoint to dispose of raw sewage in the ocean. Disposal of, uh, of sewage to sea is part of a, of a natural ecosystem that's been going on ever since man has been on this earth. And as long as we can keep that away from beaches, then there is no risk to public health. When I figured out that people were actually putting their waste into the sea, I know that this is bad and I know we should change this. I have a right to not being put at risk. And I demand that right. In most campaigns is that they're done by grassroots people, ordinary people. Therefore, that's why I'm quite positive about the future, because I think people are actually acting on what they believe in, rather than just thinking about it. Volunteers, mainly young people living in the town, began the work of raising the standards of the older areas to approach the quality of the new. We do litter picks, which helps the uh, trees and the waterfalls and the animals that live here go and we just do a lot of work down here. It's the younger people who are going to look after the world and these are the people who will be able to make impressions and change views and then the environment becomes an issue that you act upon, not just talk about. Matthew's intense interest in natural history led him to set up the Wildlife Research Centre and its own magazine which now boasts a worldwide circulation. Had you have made it to the Orkneys, what did you intend to do to prevent the cull taking place? Well, I would have stood outside the seals and in front of them so they couldn't shoot them because they were under orders not to shoot if there was any protestants there. Why did you join Friends of the Earth? Because <laughs> I thought that people should stop slaughtering whales. Do you think we should stop being killed now? Well, they've got a right to live just like us. I mean, we would like the people who are killing us. Well, I think it's just cruel. I mean, I don't like cruelty to animals, and I don't like the way people who go in for blood sports try to justify them by saying they're not cruel. If they just, you know, admitted it to be half the battle. It's a very uphill struggle because 99% of the world don't care. 99% are only self-orientators. They make enough money, enough food to live. And because of this blind policy, we are, are gradually exterminating the animal world. As our demands grow, it will require increasing skill to integrate our needs with those of nature. Techniques that are being developed today give hope that this can be achieved. It's on occasions like this, when confronted by a vista of unspoiled countryside, that one should ponder upon the scene and realize how important it is that it should always remain so. The transition from old to new is happening everywhere and more enjoyable for all. Taking responsibility for the mess that we're creating and clearing it out behind us and really recycling it into beauty and ecological restoration. What could be more healing to the soul than, than that? The very close communication with nature just adds to the sense of, of spiritual strength, I think. And looking at it at the moment, it's hard to believe it'll ever be transformed. It's always been a very industrial area, but today it's hoped their grandchildren will be the ones to benefit from the new farm. I think it's fabulous. Because it's going to fetch a bit of country life into the heart of the city. Whatever we're doing to the environment, it's our children that are going to have to cope with it. Our children and our grandchildren. And once you have children, they're the most precious thing to you and you don't want to leave them with a mess. A river, some parts deep, and some just rippling over the stones, swooping birds, gliding across the water, how swift they fly. The boy is on the bank, fixing his net up. He paddles in the shallows, his keen eye on the water. Standing alone, 
gives a feeling that makes you tiny against the great river. All is quiet, and I look ahead. I see the river bend, and then I think, how far does the river flow? Does it go on forever? The future is in our hands. We have a chance to shine on this planet that we call home. Our gift is what we leave behind. And by wanting not just to exist, we begin. <laughs>